Welcome to Conversations. I'm Mukhtar Darkhan, your host. And today I'm going to talk to you about an article that I published uh, in The Diplomat. The Diplomat is one of the, uh, the world's one of the most uh, top. Uh... Welcome to Conversations. I'm Mukhtar Darkhan, your host. And today I'm going to talk to you about an article I wrote, which was published today in The Diplomat. It is about India's diplomacy in 2023. But before I do that, please do the needful, that is subscribe to the channel, uh, like the video, press the bell icon, and subsequently after you finish watching this, don't forget to share it with your friends and your social media. So in this article titled, uh, Why India is Successful in Bilateral Diplomacy and Not That Successful in Multilateral Forums, I look at the 20, year 2023, which was supposed to be the year when India was supposed to shine uh, on the diplomatic stage, on the world stage, out of, a, a, shall we say, a fortuitous circumstances, India became the chairman of uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and also the president of the G20 Forum in the same year. So it was a great opportunity for India to host two of the world's most important multilateral forums uh, at home. Leaders would come to India twice, prominent leaders uh, of SEO and uh, G20, some of them are common, would be coming to India twice. So it gives a great opportunity uh, to India to showcase the country uh, to, 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 to the major nations in the world. It also gives uh, most of the Indian population to look at uh, how India is being recognized and welcomed uh, by the major powers of the world into the inner circles of global governance, so to speak. This was a year where India would try and become the leader of the global south by speaking for the global south, by advancing the agenda of the global south on the international stage, by being the voice of those countries who are left out of G20 in particular. Uh, not so much out of SCO because that's an organization, whereas Glo G20 is a global forum. India was going to bring the interests and the concerns of the Global South to both these organizations. SCO is an organization composed of only eight countries. Iran joined this year to make it nine. Uh, it is one of the most important forums uh, uh, which is not dominated uh, by Western nations. In fact, there are no Western countries in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. G20, on the other hand, is dominated by Western countries, by G7, uh, and it is composed of the top 20 economies in the world. Uh, and barring a few, most of the countries that are part of the G20 club are Western nations, Europeans, North Americans, uh, and Japan. So, so what happened? Uh, unfortunately, uh, the war, Russia's war in Ukraine, more or less uh, undermined India's glorious year of diplomacy. So India was seeking to change the global conversation by bringing the concerns of the global south uh, to the global forum. That was the case. But there seems to be a huge divide in what the South cares for and what the North cares for. The North seems to be, at the moment, a single issue zone. They all care only about Ukraine. Yes, the war is important, significant. It is perhaps an effort to destroy the global order, which privileges Western nations. But it has had and is having a huge impact on the global south too is causing food shortages, creating food insecurities. Uh, there are shortages of fertilizers and fuel causing inflation, undermining developing economies, pushing economies uh, towards uh, basically reneging on their debts uh, and into the arms of uh, the IMF. So there is a debt crisis which is directly connected uh, to inflation, uh, decline of exports and trade, and so on and so forth. So, so the war is definitely impacting the global south, but the global south concerns uh, are being marginalized. So essentially what has happened for India is this. Uh, the SCO, which was supposed to be 
it's a crowning jewel <laughs> where India uh, got to emphasize the fact that it is able to sustain its strategic autonomy. It can come closer and closer to the West, but also be the kingpin in the SCO and undermine the fact that India has a foreign policy of multi-alignment. It can align with the West and align with the East. But India then realized that that's not the direction in which things were going. And so India itself undermined the SCO by reducing it to a virtual event of a few hours. Instead of two days of gala events uh, with uh, the president of Russia and president of China uh, coming to India and discussing uh, the issues that they would like to discuss, which is combating uh, essentially terrorism, extremism, uh, and also uh, trying to talk about development uh, and also resisting uh, what China calls is the hegemonic posture of the United States and Western countries. Uh, and so as a result of that, uh, the SCO diminished and there was just a Zoom conference for a few hours. And even the communique that came out uh, clearly showed that India was isolated from the other countries because uh, while they agreed upon terrorism and environmental, on one of the key issues that China was pushing, which is the Belt and Road Initiative, all other countries uh, endorsed it except India. So it, rather than India uh, enjoying uh, the, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization's event as, uh, as a charming host, showcasing its culture, its values, and its uh, diplomatic prowess, India was left uh, in some ways isolated from SCO and raising the issues, should India even now continue to be a member of SCO, India will in order to ensure that Russia and China don't become too close or do not fully dominate the non-Western agenda, uh, which would include BRICS and the Global South. So India will remain in SCO, but the question, it did raise the question that should India remain in the SCO after the way uh, the SCO event went. As far as the G20 is concerned, G20, India has enjoyed partial success in the sense that the middle levels, uh, there have been successful events, hundreds of conferences all over the place. Uh, the tourism conference in Kashmir, for example, was reasonably successful. Uh, but uh, the main events that we have had so far, the finance minister's conference, as well as the foreign minister's conference, both have merely highlighted the lack of consensus in G20 countries and the tensions between G7 and the rest of the world, the tensions between the West and Russia and China on the other hand. And it also exposed India's uh, limits of India's dipl diplomatic power and prowess because both those events, the foreign minister's event as well as uh, the finance minister's event did not uh, result in a final communique. There was no consensus uh, at this event uh, and, uh, and as a result of that, uh, the only thing that seemed to be coming out is, uh, is that the most important uh, issue for Western countries uh, is Ukraine and India, China, and Russia are not with the West uh, on, or not on the same page, obviously because of Russia uh, on that page. And so the G20 is at the moment divided. Uh, so Hasini Haider, who is uh, an editor with The Hindu, she does a show called The Worldview. And on that, she has uh, discussed the possibility that the main event where heads of states of G20 are going to come uh, to India in September, there is a possibility that there may be no consensus. And for the first time in G20's uh, history of more than two decades, uh, you might have a con convention uh, where there is uh, no consensus. Uh, all of this kind of uh, undermines or takes away the shine and glory from India's uh, year of diplomacy. However, when you look at the bilateral aspects of India, uh, Prime Minister Modi has traveled to several countries. He went to uh, Papua New Guinea. He went to uh, the United States, France, Egypt. Uh, he went to, to Australia. Uh, and uh, he also went to Japan for, to attend uh, the G7 uh, event. Uh, so he has traveled 
quite a bit in the world. Uh, surprisingly, for someone who started claiming since last year that uh, India that he would like to be the voice of the global south, he seems to be traveling a lot more in the global north than in the global south, uh, and. Uh, He's been received very well in the West, undoubtedly. There has been some criticism about India's human rights situation. Uh, there was a resolution passed uh, by the European Parliament about the, the terrible situation in, in Manipur uh, when he was in the United States, even though he was received uh, and in a very glorious fashion, really, two dinners at the White House, a state dinner. Uh, and then he was invited to address both the houses of the Congress, very prestigious, very, very few leaders are uh, given this honor. But while this was happening, there were also members of the parliament uh, of the US Congress who were protesting, writing letters, uh, trying, to, uh, uh, trying to draw attention to India's human rights record, arguing that India's democracy is receding. Uh, and of course, President Barack Obama, who is very, very popular in the US and the West also, uh, spoke up on this particular issue. So yes, that took a little bit of the shine off, but the fact that India signed so many contracts with the United States, as well as with France, bought submarines and uh, aircraft carrier bone, uh, Mira uh, not Mirages, Rafales, uh, Marine Rafales from France, 26 of them, uh, the shopping bill in Paris was about nine to $10 billion. In the United States, uh, India bought uh, 18 advanced, uh, drones, uh, which cost about $3 billion. Uh, tremendous uh, agreements were made, including transfer uh, and joint manufacture of jet engines uh, and, and, and lots of other defense-related arrangements were made. So, so in that sense, the bilateral, uh, uh, shall we say, diplomacy was very successful. So the, the point that I'm trying to make is that even though at the beginning of the year I had done a conversation, I will post a link to it in the description, called that this was the year when India would get a taste and a test of its potential as a global leader. So it did get a taste of the challenges that a potential global leader faces in trying to bring consensus and take the world in the direction that it wants to go in. Uh, and that, they, that India wants to make India's interests and India's priorities as global priorities. And in trying to pursue that, India has found that it is not that easy to do, especially in multi uh, multilateral forums like G20 and SEO. Uh, but uh, in the bilateral arena, India has been far more successful. Mm, India has been appreciated. All eyes seem to be on India, uh, but partly because of the shopping spree that India is going on, buying a huge amount of defense equipment. Uh, so, so the question arises, is India uh, doing well in the bilateral diplomacy because it is now a big market for defense and other products? Or is there something else about India, its values, et cetera, which are making it attractive for other countries? I argue basically is that, that one of the reasons why India has not fared very well in multilateral forums is because there are more powerful countries in the world who are at these forums. Russia and China will not agree with the US uh, and European nations uh, and, the, and India is not able to pressure either of the two uh, to essentially agree or come to some broad consensus. Um, for example, on G20, even though there was agreement at the Bali, now the same country, especially Russia and China, are unwilling to agree upon the paragraph that they had agreed upon uh, uh, in the previous uh, cycle of the G20 meetings in Bali. So India has, has realized that it is not that easy to push and, and cajole uh, stronger powers uh, to, to change their point of view that easily. But in the bilateral issues, I think very clearly the fact that India has become the world's biggest uh, purchaser of uh, military equipment, uh, it's not surprising that it is having good relations uh, with countries who are major producers and exporters of uh, weapons, such as the United States, as well as France. And of course, the growing perception in the West that China and the West are heading towards uh, a Cold War and India 
uh, is going to play an important role based on whether it remains neutral or whether it's sides with China, which is extremely unlikely, or if it definitely joins uh, the Western camp. Uh, now, there is an interesting caveat that I think that in future, uh, Prime Minister Modi is not going to have as successful bilateral visits abroad, especially in the West, as it did, as he did in the in 2023, because the issue of Manipur has simply exploded. Uh, this I did not write in the article, but I'm just sharing uh, with you here as my closing remarks. Because of the globalization of the horror of Manipur, in his future trips to the West, he will have to answer the question as to why for two months he did not take any action in Manipur and why his party, which was governing Manipur, uh, uh, was unable to stop the violence uh, and the horrendous things that were taking place in Manipur for such a long time, and why he didn't speak to it, why he didn't speak to it. He stood here in the Washington and told the world that there was no discrimination uh, in India and the, and the struggle in, in Manipur is about exactly that. So going forward, I think even bilateral diplomacy might become tougher, but let's hope India is becoming a bigger and bigger economy. India is uh, still a vibrant democracy in spite of its flaws. Uh, and so as long as India continues to have a vibrant uh, and, uh, shall we say, uh, noisy democracy uh, and continues to have a, an economy which is growing at the pace that it is currently growing, India's stature in the world is continuous, is going to continue and as it becomes more and more powerful, it is definitely more likely to be able to impact uh, the multilateral forums uh, as much as it is at the moment enjoying success in the bilateral forum. Uh, I want to close with an interesting observation made by one of um, the followers of conversation. Uh, I shared the article this morning uh, in the community section and one of the persons there, his name is Spider-Man. I asked him for his real name, but he did not share that with me. Spider-Man pointed out that in the past few years, India in the cricket field has also done very well in bilateral series, winning bilateral series all the time as it just finished, it beat West Indies this week. So India has been winning bilateral series, but failing in multilateral tournaments of ICC and hasn't won a cup, uh, an ICC cup in, over 10 years. So that was an interesting analogy pointed out by one of the viewers of conversations. Uh, so I hope you uh, found this uh, uh, discussion of my article interesting. Please go and read the article. I will have a link to that in the description of the video. I will also have a link uh, to, to the conversation that I did uh, about uh, India testing uh, uh, and having a test, uh, global leadership as a taste and test of India's global leadership. Uh, so please uh, subscribe to Conversation, press the bell icon, like the video and share it with your friends uh, and colleagues and your social network. Until next time, this is Muhtadar Khan. Take care.